ESM Go Chok Tong, Sister Mary Liu, NTUC President, Brother Ng Chi Meng, NTUC Sek Jen, brothers and sisters, a very good morning to everybody. I'm delighted to join you this morning for this year's NTUC Delegates Conference. I'm particularly happy that it's here in Orchid Country Club because the first time I addressed an NTUC Delegates Conference was here in, in, in the country Orchid Club in the year 2000. And 23 years have passed and we are back here and we are back here for the Delegates Conference again and in the year of LKY 100. So it's a very good occasion. It's a good occasion to reflect on the special relationship that Mr. Lee had with the unions. Because as a young lawyer, Mr. Lee began his political journey by fighting for workers' rights. He represented the Postal and Telecommunications Uniform Staff Union when the postmen went on strike in 1952. He championed their cause tenaciously and brilliantly and he successfully secured for the postman higher wages and better employment terms. Thus, when Mr. Lee set up the People's Action Party two years later in 1954, the unions were on his side. At the inaugural PAP meeting at the Victoria Memorial Hall, almost half the 14 conveners of the PAP were unionists. They included Mr. Devon Nair, who was NTUC's founding Secretary General, and they also included Fong Sui Swan, who later became the founding Secretary General of SATU, the Singapore Association of Trade Unions. Those of you who are not quite that old may not realize, but SATU was the rival of NTUC. In the next few years, one union after another invited Mr. Lee to become their legal advisor. And eventually, he became legal advisor to nearly 100 unions. Many were left-wing pro-communist unions. Indeed, they were the largest ones. And these pro-communist unions made common cause with a non-communist group in the PAP to fight against colonialism, and to fight for self-government, and then independence. And that was how, in 1959, the PAP won the general elections and formed the government of the state of Singapore. But once the PAP was in power, there was a parting of ways, as both sides had fully anticipated. Two years later, in 1961, the left-wing group split off from the PAP to form the Barisan Socialists. And they took the left-wing unions with them to form SATU. As I said, it was led by Fong Sui Suan. They pressured the government on all fronts to give up on merger because their goal was a communist Malaya a communist Malaya that included Singapore. So they organized multiple strikes and fomented mayhem to bring the government down. Just imagine in barely one year, from July 1961, when the Barisan split off, to September 1962, 15 months, there were more than 150 strikes, 10 strikes per month. And their aim was not to improve the lot of the workers, it was to oust the PAP government and take power themselves. The PAP knew that to defeat the pro-communists, it needed strong support from the workers. So Devon Nair and Ho Si Bing formed, Ho si Bing formed the NTUC to rally the pro-PAP unions. The NTUC was a rump. Satu had 82 unions, joining it, but the NTUC could only find 12 unions to be affiliated to it. But eventually, the NTUC and the PAP 
gain ground, won support, and became dominant. I recall this history for a reason. As I told the PAP convention recently, the PAP was not born dominant, and neither was the NTUC born dominant. In 1961, the PAP was almost defeated by the pro-communists. Then, in 1965, when we were in Malaysia, it was almost squelched by the pro-communalists, by the communalists. But we survived these baptisms of fire, these infernos, because Mr. Lee and his comrades refused to give in. And Singaporeans, above all the workers, saw that Mr. Lee would never let them down, took heart, backed the PAP. And so we came through, the PAP together with the NTUC. So when we talk about the symbiotic relationship between the PAP and the NTUC, it's not just an institutional arrangement, it's not just a forming of joint committees. It is rooted in history, born in struggle, forged in battle. After Singapore separated from Malaysia, the new country launched on a path of industrialization and growth. But soon the British decided to withdraw their forces and to close their military bases in Singapore. Tens of thousands of workers stood to lose their jobs. Our economy was plunged into a crisis. The dire situation demanded a decisive response. So, in 1968, three years after independence, the PAP government passed the Industrial Relations Amendment Act. It created a more structured system for collective bargaining and resolution of disputes. Understandably, workers saw this as restricting their rights to engage in industrial action. The change was deeply unpopular, and yet it was vital to attract investments to Singapore so that investors will have confidence that this is an environment which is orderly, which is predictable, which is fair, which is productive. And it had to be done. Fortunately, the NTUC unions and MPs understood the problem and persuaded the workers to accept the bitter medicine. This boosted confidence, investments flowed in, displaced workers found new jobs, and a grave economic crisis was averted. In the end, when the British left, with the Industrial Relations Amendment Act, with the full support of the workers, with confidence restored, Actually, we sailed through. There was no crisis, but only because we took action to prevent the crisis from happening. And it was not the last time that Singapore avoided a crisis and it felt as if nothing had happened. But actually, a lot of things had to go right to make sure that we came through. The following year, 1969, saw another turning point in our labour management relations. The NTUC held the Modernisation Seminar. Many founding leaders spoke at the seminar, including Mr. Lee, Devon Nair, Go Keng Sui, and S. Rajaratnam. They were determined to break the mould of zero-sum adversarial labour management relations. They exhorted the unions to look beyond narrow short-term gains and instead work for the government and employers for the greater long-term good of workers and of Singapore. Mr. Rajatnam was then the Labour Minister and he said, all three must make modernization and economic development their common objective and overriding consideration. All three meaning the unions, the employers, and the government. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew saw the unions as equal partners, playing a key role in nation building. He pointed out that there was a school of thought, that it's better for an underdeveloped economy not to have trade unions, just like South Korea or Taiwan, which at that time did not have trade unions. 
Later on, that unions became quite fierce. But at that time, they didn't have any. They were under martial rule. And it seemed to be the way to make progress. But Mr. Lee did not agree. He was convinced Singaporeans had to be a proud and rugged people, and the unions were key to this. In his words, we do not want our workers submissive, docile, toadying up to the foreman, the foreman to the supervisor, and the supervisor to the boss for increments and promotions. Self-respect is what our trade unions have and will give to workers. That protection for a man's right to his own dignity, his dignity as a human being, as a citizen. And there you have it. Why we have unions in Singapore, why we have strengthened the unions over the years, why the symbiosis between the PAP and the NTUC continues and remains of vital importance. We are two sides of one national movement, we meaning the PAP and the NTUC. Two sides of one national movement, devoted to improving the lives of all Singaporeans, keeping us all together as one united people, and ensuring that everyone, even the lowest paid worker, has a right to his own dignity, his dignity as a human being, as a citizen. The Modernization Seminar established our unique model of tripartism. It completely changed the tone of labor relations. Through collaboration and compromise, we fostered industrial peace. Even as the unions continued to fight for workers, they kept the bigger picture in mind, and they were careful not to upset the apple cart by disrupting Singapore's economic growth. Coupled with a well-educated and disciplined workforce, this enabled us to industrialize, to develop our economy, and take off. Of course, the unions continued to secure a fair deal for workers, especially through collective bargaining. And one key tripartite mechanism we developed for this was the National Wages Council, NWC. Each year, the unions, the workers, and the government would meet the representatives would meet in the NWC. And for close to 30 years, they deliberated under the deft chairmanship of Professor Lim Chong Yah, who sadly passed away just a few months ago in July this year. The NWC would form a consensus view of the state of the economy and make recommendations for wage adjustments. And these NWC recommendations provided a national framework which made bargaining at the company level much smoother. It helped the unionists to do their job. In good years, workers shared in the upside through higher wage settlements and bonuses. In lean years, workers accepted lower wage settlements and occasionally even wage cuts once or twice to help preserve jobs and enable the economy to recover. This habit of working together fostered mutual trust and respect. In time, the NWC went beyond recommending wage adjustments to deal with structural issues, structural issues like implementing flexible wages, supporting lower-income workers, and promoting worker retraining. Tripartism has been an enormous and enduring advantage as we restructured and grew our economy. It's truly our national treasure. You can see it, you can admire it, you can try to imitate it, you can't do it the same in other places. It's an open secret. We'll look at PSA, one of the leading ports in the world. Year after year, the PSA has had to modernize, upgrade, and automate its port operations to reduce its costs even further, to keep operating more efficiently than other ports, 
to make up for the lack of a hinterland and for a tight labour market. And along the way, PSA had to make many difficult decisions. Sometimes job losses could not be avoided. But each time the tripartite partners, PSA, the unions, the government, worked together to make sure we took care of the workers and to help those who had to leave to find new jobs. Without the full support of the Port Officers Union, Sister Mary's own union, and the Port Workers Union, PSA could not have done it. I remember meeting a British Union delegation in the late 1980s. I was then in MTI, they came to visit Singapore, they visited the port, they, visited, they called on me. They represented the dock workers from the Port of London. British ports, particularly the London docks, were well known for having difficult labour relations. The workers and the unions and the union resisted automation and change. They fought to preserve existing jobs and traditional ways of working, even when these were becoming obsolete and non-viable. So when the British unionists visited the PSA, they were puzzled why the PSA and port workers were not similarly quarrelling. So they asked me, and I tried to explain to them our tripartite model, but I don't think they grasped how we could make it work. They were just stuck in a different place, in a different kind of history and relationship. Till today, British ports' operations are frequently paralysed by strikes and disputes, causing container traffic to be diverted to other ports in Europe. But in Singapore, our tripartite partners continue to cooperate closely to transform PSA's operations, to redesign jobs, to retrain and upgrade workers. And that's how we made PSA a world-class port. Today, the second busiest in the world with a new mega port coming up in Tuas. And that's how we create new opportunities and prospects, not just for our port workers, but for Singapore as a whole. The most severe test of our tripartism comes when we run into a crisis, like COVID-19, recently. Both our lives and livelihoods were in great danger. The tripartite partners got together swiftly to help workers and companies to pull through. The government, supported by the NTUC and SNEF, implemented waves of safe management measures. These were disruptive but essential to save lives. The government also passed successive special budgets, drawing heavily from past reserves to fund emergency schemes. The NTUC, supported by SNEF and MOM, quickly set up the Job Security Council. The council helped to redeploy 70,000 workers from pandemic hit sectors like aviation to sectors that need, urgently needed manpower, like healthcare. And it helped many workers and their families to tide through the pandemic and made all the difference. With funding from the government, NTUC also implemented SERS, the Self-Employed Person Income Relief Scheme. Together with the NTUC Training Fund for Self-Employed Persons, this provided great relief to 200,000 self-employed workers. We couldn't do the help through an employer, and so we set up the scheme to deal directly with them. And NTUC had to deal with 200,000 self-employed persons. It's a huge number. But they did their job, they took the responsibility, and they delivered the help. I would like to thank everyone at NTUC for pitching in during the crisis and helping Singapore to emerge stronger and more united. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Tripartism can work in Singapore because the PAP government is pro-growth and pro-worker. That's why we say PAP, pro-growth and pro-worker. Yeah. 
As Mr. Lee said, the PAP has been a workers' movement and has always received the support of the workers. A PAP government is a government on the workers' side. In Singapore, we share the benefits of progress with all and not just with a few. That was a credo of Mr. Lee and our founding fathers, and today it remains the PAP government's credo. At the national level, the PAP government is focused on twin priorities. First, growing and developing our economy, and second, at the same time, enabling the workers to benefit fully from the economic growth that we create. So you grow the economy, at the same time we make sure it grows in such a way that the workers can benefit fully from the prosperity which is generated. So every Singaporean can enjoy good housing, healthcare, education, all subsidized heavily by the state. We not only create good jobs, but we educate and train workers to enable them to perform these jobs. And that's why Singaporeans can look forward to better wages, higher standards of living, and brighter opportunities. With Forward SG, we'll be doing even more to uplift workers, and especially to help those at the lower end to catch up. With the government leading the country in the right direction, it's much easier for the tripartite partners to work together to create prosperity and to share the fruits of growth. Because the framework is there, the big architecture is there, the government is doing the right thing. Within that, the country is heading in the right direction, the tripartite partners, we can work together to make sure that everything turns out well. And so, as a result, we have created a Singapore premium. A Singapore premium. Companies and investors are prepared to pay more to be here, to take advantage of our harmonious industrial relations and business-friendly environment. They value being in a country that knows where it's heading, where everyone pulls together for the common good. Everything works, and life can get better for all. And Singaporeans enjoy this premium personally. You carry a pink IC, you have a red passport, you go with pride and confidence anywhere in the world. You are at a premium because of your identity, because you are part of this Singapore team. Our workers do similar jobs as other workers in the region. But because companies can operate more efficiently and reliably here, because they can rely on our political stability and competent, clean government, because they have every confidence and trust in Singapore and in you. Therefore, for doing the same job, workers in Singapore can earn significantly more than workers anywhere else in the region. That's why people are coming into Singapore to work work permit holders, S-pass holders, employment pass holders, to be here, to be part of this successful team, is to command a premium. Not the opposite. You don't find Singaporeans queuing up to go somewhere nearby to work. A lot of people come here from not very far away to work. There is a reason, and we must keep it that way. But the PAP has not just provided Singapore with good government or improved people's lives through sound policies. The PAP has also done its best to keep the cost of government as low as possible. Even as standards of living rise, our aspirations and expectations have also gone up. So although incomes have risen steadily year by year, many households still feel the pressures of the cost of living. And the PAP government is very conscious of this, and it does its utmost to moderate these pressures on households. How do we do this? First, we run a lean and efficient government. Everything the government does, all our programs, all our projects, they have to be paid for. Somebody has to pay for it. Who pays for it? Ultimately, taxpayers pay for it. 
and we have kept this burden of the cost of the government as low as possible, and much lower than most developed countries. In Singapore, government revenues from fees and taxes make up only 15% of the GDP. Of all the money we produce in Singapore, all the value added in Singapore, only 15 cents in the dollar is taken by the government and used to run the system. 15%. If you look at Italy, a developed country in Europe, they spend about this amount just on state pensions, 15.3%, not on their whole budget, just pensions alone, is equal to the same percentage of GDP as our entire GST, personal income tax, property tax, COEs, the whole lot. Next year, our GST is going up to 9%. People don't like it. It's not welcome. But see this in perspective. Italy has something equivalent to the GST. They call it the Value Added Tax, VAT. All the European countries have it. In Italy, the Value Added Tax standard rate is 22%. Our GST is going to 9 And if you look at Scandinavian countries like Sweden and Denmark, their standard VAT rate is 25%. So it's a very heavy burden of government in those countries on that model. But in our model, by keeping government spending and taxes low, we allow workers to enjoy the fruits of their own labour directly. What you earn, you can decide. You want to spend it on your children, that's good. You want to spend it on your house, that's up to you. You want to take it and go on holiday with your family? Well, a lot of Singaporeans do that. By the millions, literally. But it's your choice. Rather than the government takes it from you and decides on your behalf that this is what we will do for you. So I can say that in terms of government services, Singaporeans are getting very good value for money. I would even say very cheap. So, secondly, to keep the cost of living low, we make sure that essential public services, like public transport, like water, like electricity, like healthcare, they are run efficiently and cost effectively. Because, again, one way or the other, somebody has to pay for these services. And either the user pays through water and electricity tariffs, or public transport fares, or the government has to pay, subsidize them, which means ultimately, again, the taxpayer pays indirectly through higher taxes. So in Singapore, we've avoided putting the whole burden on taxpayers. We require users to pay reasonable charges for these services. And we also require the operations to break even and to earn a return also known as a profit. Because that puts pressure on the operators to be efficient, to run in the best way which they can to keep their costs down. And it translates to cost savings for Singaporeans. Sometimes people argue that because these are public services, they shouldn't aim to earn any profit at all. But I think that would be the wrong approach. Because that way, the transport operators and utilities providers would have no pressure to run efficiently. Just because a company is not making a profit doesn't mean it is giving you a cheap and good service. It may mean that it is running inefficiently, that you don't know that you are paying more, but it's not delivering value to you. You are just paying more and getting less. So it's better to let these service providers earn a reasonable profit so that they have the resources to reinvest and improve services and also the incentive to do this. Because if they work harder, if they do better, they earn a little bit more. And that's how it works. I mean, when you go to work, you work harder, you perform better, you get more bonus. 
Nobody says, don't, do, don't have bonuses, just have fixed pay. You want to have some incentive there. And a profit is an incentive, and properly managed, it's a good way to make the incentive. It's the same with NTUC Enterprises. If NTUC Fair Price didn't break even and make a surplus every year, and they didn't give some dividends to all the NTUC Fair Price members every year, do you think it could grow the business and improve services to its members? It would have shut down long ago. Or the Chinese say, Kuan Men Ta Ji. But because it has to break even, because there's a lot of pressure on the NTUC Fair Price Board, because we make them pay rent when they rent HDB properties. Therefore, they are able to run, they, they recruit a good management team, they run a good operation, they break even, and they are able to have house brands, they are able to have basic necessities kept very affordable, and they have a small dividend for you at the end of the year if you have been a loyal customer. I think it's a good model. And in fact, one of Dr. Go King Sui's mo motivations for mooting the setting up of co-ops, the first one was income, not fair price, but fair price came later, but the motivation was the same. And that motivation was so that union leaders will learn how businesses are supposed to work and they can understand profit is not a dirty word. So this is our approach. There's a reason we do it this way and we think it is the right way to do it for workers' interests. But of course, it's not always so easy to do because when, from time to time, the costs of providing these services go up, then the charges also have to be adjusted, also have to go up. Whether it's public transport fares, whether it's electricity tariffs, water tariffs, hospital fees. Sometimes they have to be adjusted each time it's hard. Fair increases, fee increases are never welcome. We must always get the companies to try hard, to trim costs further, to operate more efficiently. And we must be very careful not simply to pass on any higher costs to consumers without thinking about it. But still, when fee increases or fair increases cannot be avoided, we have to go through with them. Sometimes you can enhance productivity, you can save money, you can pass on the benefits to, con to commuters, to consumers. Bus dry bus buses in Singapore used to have conductors, two men per bus. It costs money, and the conductor can't earn very much because it's not a very productive job. So, to save costs, we went from 2MO to OMO. One man operation, one bus conductor, or one bus driver. He sits there, you come on, you tap, he does everything, he gets paid more, he has a bigger job, service quality improve. What do I do next? One day, maybe no MO. No bus driver. You go on, the robot says, hi, good morning. <laughs> and then you get onto the bus. It may come, not so soon, but it may come. But meanwhile, when costs go up, when wages go up, when, petrol, when diesel prices go up, when new buses which are safer cost more, what do we do? Well, you have to adjust fares and we have to explain to people why this has to be done. I think overall this approach has worked quite well. We've brought our public transport system to a high standard. Our fares, frankly speaking, are among the lowest in the developed world. Our utilities are reliable and affordable. You turn on a tap, water comes out. Clean water comes out. Water you can drink. You flick the switch, the light comes on. It comes on properly. It doesn't flicker, 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 and go out. I went, to a, I went on an overseas visit earlier this year. I visited the museum. I went to the museum. 
they had little lights in the corners everywhere. They said, very sorry, today black out. <laughs> Can't be helped. It, is a, it was a national problem. Everybody knew it. Cannot be solved. But if that happens in Singapore, I will be preparing to answer questions in Parliament this afternoon. <laughs> so we have got good value for money. Good services, I would say, good unions and good government. All very cheap. This strategy has kept costs moderate for all households. But some households will have special circumstances, will need extra help, and we have provided this extra help. We've given them targeted assistance in the form of cash or vouchers, like you save rebates, public transport vouchers, GST vouchers, CDC vouchers, Medifund to help you pay your medical fees if you can't afford even the subsidized rates. And we target it so that those who most need help get the most help. And depending on household, it can be a lot of help. So the some households will get up to $9,000 of direct help in this financial year. It's not a small sum of money. For a household like that, it may be three, four, five times their monthly income. And this way, it's much better than subsidizing electricity or water prices across the board, which some other countries do. Because with across-the-board subsidies, who gets the most benefit? the households who use the most water and electricity. And they are not the poor, small households. They are the not-so-poor, reasonably well-off, bigger households. They've got bigger properties. They may have a koi pond or maybe an arowana tank. <laughs> they may have a big screen TV. They may have a home theatre, well, all that costs water, electricity, and they're consuming war, more. Why should I subsidise them more? What for? They don't need it. I should take my resources and help the people who need the help. Also, if I subsidise it across the board, then households will have no incentive to save, to conserve, because they don't bear the proper cost. Instead of paying 30 cents per kilowatt hour, you're paying 10 cents. There's no, no incentive to say you're leaving the room, better turn the light off. Your children don't turn the light off, you scold them a little bit. In the former Soviet Union, when everything was practically free, you leave the room, one of our unionists went there. He left the room, he turned the lights off. His host scolded him. He said, you're stupid, we're not paying for the electricity, why you turn the light off? So you want to do the right thing for Singaporeans. Sometimes people say it's tough love, but it's not so tough. It's real love. <laughs> so that's why our strategy, I think, is better. But of course, in a difficult year like this one, when growth is slower, when prices are going up faster, when wages are not quite keeping up with prices, then we need to think what more we can do to help Singaporeans because you don't want to add to the burden of Singaporeans. Can we delay the price adjustments to a more favourable time? Actually, there's no favourable time, but less unfavourable time. Or should we just proceed with the fee increases and carefully manage their overall impact on households? And I think we do a combination of both. Naturally, in a difficult year, we think extra hard about increasing fees. If it's not essential, if we can delay them a while longer, or at least moderate the immediate increase, we should do that. Hold it off a little bit, just tahan, and we can manage. Next year, maybe it's not so difficult. And we have done that. For example, with public transport fares. This year, the government has absorbed two-thirds of what the increase was supposed to be. We have a formula. The formula gave a number. It was like 10-12%. percent 
we said, no, this year we can't do that. We will just do one third. We can't do nothing, we will do one third. But the two thirds the government will absorb. And for this year, that means the government uncle writes the check for $300 million. Just for this year. It's not cheap. But for this year, I think it's necessary we do that. But some price increases will not be avoidable or postponable. And if you just push them off, it doesn't solve the problem because next year the, the shortfall will become bigger. Then what do you do? And in that case, sometimes after thinking about it, you have no choice. Well, we have to proceed. But we will also, if necessary, be more generous with the targeted support to households. So people know that it's not just putting, paying more, but the households who really have difficulty, they'll get more help. So with public transport fares, there are public transport vouchers. And this year, the voucher is a bit more generous than previous years. Water prices have gone up. We have USAFE. And the USAFE helps you to pay for water price. And in fact, even more. And I think this approach has worked. In previous downturns, we would see a lot of families or more families who would have difficulty with their utilities bills. They would go to PUB, they would have to get pay as you earn, pay as you use meters, and then you top up the card, you turn on the light, the card runs down. Or they would go to MPS sessions and ask MPs for help because they are at wit's end and so many bills and they come and say, my utilities bill, please help me. But this time, since COVID, since we have raised the USAFE significantly to solve this problem, we have not seen an increase in people with difficulties paying their utility bills. In fact, I asked PUB for this, I asked our people for the data, MTI gave me the data. During the last three years, the number of families who have difficulties paying the utility bills have come down because we have given them targeted help. And at the same time, we have kept electricity prices at the right level. And we have kept water prices. We are adjusting them. I think we are doing the right thing. So we are keeping our public services financially sustainable and of a high standard in the long run, while in the short term, giving households extra help according to their need and sharing the burden fairly with everybody. And this is how the PAP government keeps faith with workers. We do right by them through good times and bad, and we will always do that. Looking ahead, the labour movement will need to continuously reinvent itself to stay relevant. The world is facing all kinds of challenges, great power rivalry, regional conflicts, deglobalization, climate change, technological advances. You read all our speeches, you will hear all about them. Today, no need for me to talk a lot more. And there will, but there will also be new opportunities while we experience new social and economic pressures. In tech, rapid developments in AI and robotics will dramatically change the way we live and work. Last week, I visited San Francisco. I went to Silicon Valley. I visited Google. I visited Apple. The engineers showed me some of the new projects and gizmos they are working on. Great ex excitement because they are promising, they are excited, they are very exciting to, to imagine what can be done. And they are convinced that this is going to make a radical change in a lot of jobs and will change the world. So they said, here's a robot, program it. I said, I don't know how to program a robot. They said, it's very easy, I show you. You click here, you choose this, you tell the robot to go there, you tell the robot, pick it up, come over, come down. So, with him holding my hand, I got a short tutorial. I can learn to do it. If I can learn to do it because the robot is now smarter, 
a lot of workers can learn to do it. Some jobs are not going to be there anymore. Certainly the job of the man who used to take from point A and put to point B is not going to be there anymore. But the job of the man who programs a robot, that will be a new job, and many of us will be able to learn to do it, and will have to learn how to adapt and to make a living in this environment. And that is a kind of future which we are going to be in. What does it mean for Singapore? Jobs are going to change, nature of it, significantly. And not just blue-collar jobs, but white-collar and professional jobs too. Overall, productivity should go up and we should enjoy higher growth. But to get from here to there, the transformation is going to be so great that many individual workers and livelihoods are going to be affected. How should the unions adapt to these changes? Some people think that with such rapid changes, the unions should just step aside and let the changes happen, play a small role. And in fact, elsewhere, many employers and many governments don't encourage unions. They believe that flexibility is the key, that strong unions will only get in the way of economic restructuring. You have a union, they will, you have to negotiate with them, it will take time. By the time you finish negotiating an agreement, already three new versions of the technology have come out from your competitor. Better we just go ahead and the workers, if they, can't, if they have to change jobs, well, can't be helped, let them change jobs. But from the point of view of the individual worker, when you are displaced from a job and you're on your own, it's a very painful experience. Suddenly you have to, your, your, not just your income stream has run out, but what do you do every morning? You wake up, you stare at the ceiling, what do I do next? What is the purpose in my life? And you'll be uncertain, you'll be disgruntled, you'll be worried. Sooner or later, you'll get together, all the unhappy people will get together, mobilize, and push against the changes which are affecting them, and not in a productive way. We will end up quarreling at loggerheads. It's bad. And that's why the PAP government rejects this view that unions should play a smaller role in future. At the modernization seminar, in 1969, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew expressed his conviction that Singapore's future depended on having strong unions. And I'm convinced that in a vastly changed world, in a world which is continuing to change rapidly, this is still true. The labour movement will play a vital role in Singapore for many years to come. And I know that my successor, DPM Lawrence Wong, thinks so too. <laughs> Your, what will you do as a labor movement? Your traditional roles will still be relevant, fighting for workers' rights, helping them to have good jobs, representing them in dispute settlement. But if we only seek to shield workers from disruption, if we fight to resist inevitable changes, then, like the London dock workers, the world will move on and we will be left behind. Instead, we need to carry on the spirit of the modernization seminar. We need to reinvent and reimagine the labor movement to make it one that guides workers to keep up with the changing economy and job market through upgrading and retraining to help workers to stay employable, though not always in the same job. To reassure workers, you're not alone. The labor movement is here for you. The PAP and NTUC will have your backs. And for the labor movement to work with the government to provide all Singaporeans a fair chance at success. Therefore, I'm very happy that NTUC carried out the Every Worker Matters Conversations, hex sign EWMC, over the past year. 
and the EWMC effort dovetails with the Forward Singapore exercise. Brother Chi Ming told me you held over 8,000 hours of conversations more than, with more than 42,000 workers to understand their anxieties and aspirations. I read the report. I was encouraged by your ideas to refresh the workers' compact and prepare our workforce for the future. The NTUC Learning Hub and the E2I will offer training programs to keep employers to keep workers employable. And the Ong Teng Cheong Labour Leadership Institute will run courses for union leaders to prepare them to face the new challenges. NTUC is also pushing for company training committees, CTCs, and we provided some support from the government. I'm happy it's being put to good use. CTCs reflect tripartism in a new era. We are bringing unions and companies together to drive transformation, to equip workers with future-ready skill sets, and to meet the company's business needs. There's one example, Tews Agriculture, which produces fresh eggs. They partnered NTUC USME and SISU to form a CTC to replace manual processes with an automatic egg grading and packing system. Now the operations are faster and safer. Workers have been freed up to be redeployed to other higher skilled, more productive jobs. And older workers have received extra training and they can perform their duties more safely and more easily. And the benefits and cost savings have been passed on to the workers in higher wages. Juice agriculture is now on track to increase production to one million eggs a day. <laughs> providing a more secure supply of eggs to all Singaporeans. There must be quite a few of us who had two eggs for breakfast this morning. <laughs> and this is how the tripartite partners work together to create win-win outcomes. Better profits for companies. Profits, remember, is not a dirty word. And better wages for workers. So the economists call this a virtuous circle. But I say we have cracked a chicken and egg problem. Besides fostering transformation and upgrading, I encourage the labour movement to continue broadening your representation. Take care of the different segments of the workforce, from rank and file workers to PMETs, from youth to mid-career and older workers, SMEs, gig workers, and also the migrant workforce. Work with the government, work with SNEF and SBF to support the harder-to-reach workers in the more fragmented sectors and go beyond providing representation and benefits to train workers to promote their lifelong employability. NTUC enterprises must also keep refreshing their offerings to be relevant to the workers of today and tomorrow. And this will help to maintain the trust and harmony that we've built up over the years and keep us all together as we build a more inclusive and a more united society. For all this to happen, the PAP and the NTUC must continue to work hand in hand. It's been our approach right from the very beginning, during Mr. Lee's time. The PAP worked closely with the unions to understand workers' needs, to champion their interests, to pursue policies that improve their lives and livelihoods. And on their part, the workers gave PAP a strong political base and popular support. And that was how the PAP government won the people's mandate in successive elections to implement policies and to build Singapore. More than 60 years later, the PAP is still in government and the NTUC still organizes the whole labor movement. The PAP is committed to strengthening and sustaining this political partnership for many years to come, and I'm confident so is the NTUC.
the symbiotic relationship applies at all levels. Unionists don't just turn up for party conferences. They also serve in their constituencies as branch activists. Many are party members. When they are branch activists, they wear whites. When they come to the NTUC delegates conference, national conference, they wear their U t-shirt. At the leadership level, I keep in close touch with your Secretary General, with the POHs who are in the labour movement, the MPs who are from the labour movement. We meet regularly to discuss all major policy issues and take in their views and concerns. At the same time, Brother Chi Ming and his fellow union leaders help to communicate the national perspectives to the unions, to the workers, so that you can better understand how NTUC fits into the national context, what you can help do to help us to make your lives and your jobs better. And we also must always continue building this partnership between the PAP and the NTUC. The next general election must be held within two years. The PAP looks forward to fielding new party candidates from the labour movement. Uh, we have identified a couple, and I'm confident they will represent workers and constituents well. And I look forward to them joining and entering the political fight. The labour movement is a pillar of strength for our workers and businesses. It continues to look out for workers' welfare. It secures them a share in Singapore's economic growth. It gives them a stake in our progress. I thank the outgoing Central Committee, which has led NTUC for the last four years. On top of dealing with the disruptions of the pandemic, Brother Chi Ming and his team have championed the interests of workers and resolutely delivered on their initiatives since the last NDC. And the union leaders have strengthened tripartism assiduously, dedicatedly, year after year. Like Sister Mary Liu, she's been a trade unionist since 1982, president of NTUC since 2015, and she has championed the interests of workers throughout, who's, and she will be stepping down this year. Also, Brother Ong Hui Liang, who is Vice President and has had 30 years of service in the labour movement and has done much to strengthen the relationship between unions, employers and government. He's also stepping down this year together with a few other NTUC Central Committee members. Thank you, Sister Mary, Brother Hui Liang. We wish you all the best. Tomorrow, you will be electing a new NTUC Central Committee. NTUC's success continues to depend on the quality of your leadership. Just like Singapore, the NTUC needs leaders with integrity, competence, conviction, and a genuine heart for the interests of workers and of the country. So I urge delegates, please vote wisely. Give your new leaders a strong mandate Support them, support their vision, help them to lead the labour movement to improve workers' lives. That way we continue to strengthen our model of tripartism and keep it a lasting competitive advantage in an uncertain world. That way we create a better future for workers and for Singapore. Thank you very much.